by Anne Wang. And uh, this is the last of the four talks. Uh, I've got a few more slides uh, today. It's what happens, slides migrate onwards in the course when you don't get to them. So we will press on. And this is the argument for today. So I want to start by arguing that what we could call multi-proto-lingualism is or was the prime of the human condition. Uh, and then I want to go back and look at multilingualism and language contact, uh, which where studies have tended to be dominated by scenarios of convergence and simplification. And I want to present some examples of divergence and complexification, not as the only outcome of language outcome, but as, as a contact, but as one, which I think is particularly important for our course. Uh, then I want to look in a bit more detail at contact and how memes get pulled uh, and then go back to thinking about what we talked about in the first class that is a gradualist account of language evolution and how this view uh, might help us make sense of some, some old controversies and then just tie off with a very brief consideration of what we as linguists and language scientists more generally uh, should be thinking about in the future. So we all know about the old monogenesis versus polygenesis debate. So did the human uh, language originate in one place or did it originate in many? Uh, and it's sort of a gridlocked, going nowhere sort of debate. And what I want to argue for instead is that there was what you call, might call multi-proto-lingualism, so that you had lots of different groups that had developed partial versions of modern language, each of which had made some breakthroughs, just like if you think of it, you know, maize had been developed in Mexico and chickens were uh, domesticated in Southeast Asia and horses were probably domesticated in the Eurasian steppes. All of those things later on got put together. So the claim would be our modern languages are like that. So that then gives us something that we might call polysemigenesis. Uh, that is, or well, probably the Greek purists would prefer polyhemigenesis. <laughs> um, but uh, the idea there is that there were sort of independent, partial uh, developments of the language. And then what grew all of that together, what integrated together into modern systems was multilingualism back as far as you want to go. Which runs against some widespread, at least widespread popular beliefs about multilingualism. If you talk either to the person on the street, and amazingly also to a lot of linguists, there's a widespread view that multilingualism somehow some modern phenomenon. You get a whole lot of people integrating into big cities or you know, France integrates into the EU and people have to learn one or two other languages or whatever. That, that is a, an amazingly widespread view, but it doesn't bear up against the facts. When you go out and look at lots of small-scale speech communities in the world, whether they be hunter-gatherers or swindlers, um, that is people practicing slash and burn ag agriculture, there's a view again that they're sort of isolated from one another, living in these little communities of 100 people somewhere in the middle of the jungle, uh, or in the middle of the desert, and that's very rare. What you usually get is these interlocked sets, and you can see why. You don't, you don't want to live in a universe of 100 people. You've got to find a mate, or you know, you've got to live on other people's territories during a drought or, or whatever. So um, that's something we'll see. It doesn't really bear up that view of small-scale communities as multilingualism. I'm patient to where there are always exceptions. So Kaida, the language I mentioned earlier, they were a small-scale monolingual speech community, and there are others, but then that's not typical. Um, and then there's a view that stable bilingualism requires diglossia between some high language, a language of wider communication, maybe Latin, you know, for a long period in European history, or High German if you're in Switzerland, or English more and more in the modern world, and some local language. Uh, that we will also see, um, including, you know, work by, by Alex and, and uh, before him, by uh, 
oddly cool in New Caledonia. It's just not a realistic view. So let's take an alternative view, which is that bi and multilingualism are actually typical of small scale speech communities throughout the world. You look and look in many, many places North Australia, New Guinea, Vanuatu, Cameroon, Northeast India, Amazon, I could add lots of parts of West Africa. Many parts of the world are like this, and there are still places where this is still how people live today. And individuals in such communities are really accomplished language learners. Uh, so that you get this special multi-lingual uh, ecology uh, and it's very interesting from a point of view of second language acquisition but what I should have also put on the slide people are learning multiple languages from birth so they're learning them fluently they're not knocking the edges off as they learn them in adulthood so uh, this brings us to, to uh, Alex has christened egalitarian, I can't remember if he called it egalitarian, multilingualism, but before um, uh, Audrey Cook called it um, bilingualism, egalitaire, mm -hmm. I think in his original article, which is a classic example of uh, an article whose title tell, does not tell you what it's going to be about, this is not for them. Um, so this is uh, a little photograph from one of my field sites in New Guinea, so this was my very first day I arrived in southern New Guinea and I couldn't land in the, the village uh, where I was wanting to work where they spoke the Manaban and I landed in another village about six hours walk away uh, where they spoke Idi and the and then and Idi are about as different as Spanish and Basque, really different. Uh, and this is the border, uh, so we would some young guys from the Idi speaking village just helped me carry my gear, we walked along. Halfway through, uh, we were met by people from the Maravan village and then they loaded some gear onto the bike. And so you can look at that group, you can't tell there are oh, some of those people are and then speakers, some of them are Giddy speakers who's speaking what? Because actually they both speak both of those languages and more. And we'll say more about that situation in a little while. So we know that through our human history, depending on where we come from in the world, who, who we are, uh, at most, oh sorry, at least 95% of our history, if we go back to our first speaking ancestors, our ancestors were hunter gatherers. And if you come from some parts of the world, like let's say, you know, you're an Aboriginal person in part of Australia, that's more like 99.9% of your history is hunter gatherers. So this is just a norm in throughout human history and this is what has shaped our brain as speakers and our languages if you think that all languages inherit a very deep past. Uh, so these uh, speech communities are consistently small and they typically, I won't say always, but typically practice egalitarian multilingualism. Uh, and Suzanne Romain has said this, it's a condition of life of considerable antiquity, possibly as old as the human species. I agree with her, and I've also argued in another article, and kind of re recapitulate some of the arguments in that other article today that I think multilingualism might have been a primary driver for the evolution of language. So that's the article at the top. Did language evolve in multilingual settings? And if you can see that. So I'm going to give you a couple of case studies from areas where I've worked. First one from Northern Australia. So there you finally get to see the photo that accompanied the poster for the course. Uh, and that is a rock painting in um, Arnhem Land, just in Kakadu National Park, a, a really beautiful area. Uh, very ancient uh, rock paintings. And just what you can see in that painting, you can, you can see, or in that photograph, standing on a rock ledge, looking out over the floodplains and a river, and then beyond that, some more floodplains, just in that little area that's the territory of three or four different languages from two or three, let's say high level groupings, maybe if you think of it as like, uh, you know, let's say Berber and Omotic or something like that. You know, they ultimately related, but it's very, uh, deep uh, level. So you just keep looking at 
And if you just keep going, there, there's a map of a little transect um, which heads north from where you just looked out of. Uh, uh, you can see uh, on the top left uh, is Croker Island. And in a number of oral traditions of that area, there was a founding ancestress called Waramungunji, uh, and she had set off in what's now Indonesia, around Makassar, gone under the sea, emerged on Croker Island, and as she proceeded south, she had babies and she was putting them into the landscape. And I'm just going to play you a little bit of this. This is the Iwaja uh, version of the story, as told by um, Tim Mamipa, who's now deceased. So, and he told this story uh, in the early 2000s. Sorry for the German subtitles, it might help someone. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do, more than Jimmy, what did you do? Yeah, now this one I've got the English there as well. Let's do, do it this way. So you can read along the English and look at the Uwaja on the left hand side. Next one. Not for, yeah, but not, uh, the English is in the next no, slide. No, we'll go to the next slide. Oops, sorry. This, this one, one, yeah. Good. So I'll just play it and then we'll do a replay for the Zoom group. Um, so let's just launch it, just to get an idea from the telling us. It's just to give you an idea of what the language sounds like and, and, and you know, what a particular version. Do you want to just quickly play it? Just, yes. just the first little bit. Okay. So, uh, you like gist of it is this is the equivalent story to the Babel myth in the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Babel myth sort of punts these multilingualism or rather the existence of multiple languages as a punishment to, to humans to divide them. Uh, whereas in this Waramurawanji myth, Waramurawanji creates a, a world in which each group speaks its own language, has its own ethnic name, has its own customs, and has its own little ecosystem. Eating lily seeds here, and yams here, and some other things in other parts. Uh, and we'll see later on, this has deep cosmic significance uh, because it will ensure complementarity and respect among different groups, rather than discord and enmity. So it's seen actually as a precondition of, uh, of cooperation rather than impediment to cooperation, which is the Judeo-Christian view of uh, language diversity. So I'll just go on now and just say a little bit more about the cultural background to that. So here, um, language diversity, here I mean in Indigenous Australia, but especially in um, Northern Australia, you see it strikingly. Uh, language diversity is a social resource. And languages are predominantly associated not with people, but with tracts of land. So as you move across the land, you know, you move over Iwaja country or Amarak country or whatever the language may be, and then land has affiliated with a particular clans. And then individuals happen to be born into those clans. So if you're an individual, you are part of a clan which is linked to the land and then the language is there. So the relationship of a person to a language is different and, and you are 
said to be something like a language owner, which may not be at all the same as a language speaker. People who speak the language might be somewhere entirely uh, different. And in the, the sort of etiquette that is followed there, uh, you should, because the land has spirits there and your safety as a person going around will be guaranteed if you speak the, the, the language. It's like a key unlocking your, your safety in the area. So you should always make sure to speak the appropriate language. That may not always be the case. Of course, no one can speak every language. But you would, if as a newcomer, you would go to a place and part of the welcoming ritual is that uh, the, the clan owner might call out to the spirits and saying, oh, you know, here's Alex here. He, he can't speak from Jamie, unfortunately, but he's all, he's all black, you know, he's my cousin. <laughs> look after him and so on uh, and then there are other things like making sure he smells like the land of anointing with my auntie it smells like he smells like a real Jamie clan member and stuff like that um, so this is all part of the symbolism of a language choice and you can imagine that growing there and it's very normal to pass between many clan estates in the course of the years uh, cycle, uh, there's very strong pressure just to learn as many languages as you can, aided by the fact that probably your parents speak different languages, probably your grandparents between them speak four different languages, uh, your future spouse who may be interested in wooing, uh, and especially wooing her parents, uh, or you know, like getting on good terms with her parents, uh, might speak another language again. So there's this sort of constant thing and certainly no belief in something like a critical period you know I've, I've spoken to old men in their 70s and asked them about particular language and they say oh I'm, you haven't learned that one yet and you know it's just like you know, it's constantly doing that uh, so then uh, as well as that you have a situation where the, the grand ceremonies of life so these big religious ceremonies that might run for several nights or even a month and during that you have, probably if you think of it as like the Iliad and the Odyssey in the Western tradition, so a whole number of different steps which take place at different locations, some of them in Troy, some of them in Tunisia or wherever it might be, and Ulysses travels around, you have the travelling ancestors, but the whole Odyssey is in Greek. But imagine a version of the Odyssey where each step is enacted, sung, chanted in the language of where it is. And moreover, there's not just a single performer. The performance passes to the clan owners of that part. So it's a very, it's a very distributed conception. It's actually the opposite of sort of French enlightenment universalism, or for that matter, modern universalism, where you know, knowledge should be available to all transparently, there online, there in Wikipedia. Here it sees complementarity of knowledge holding as a positive thing because it gives everyone something of their own uh, and it ensures that, for example, you don't have wars or conquests because then you would wipe out the knowledge you need to keep the, the universe uh, going. So it's you know, a very deep conception of what uh, multilingualism does and it's, that relates to what people do in their daily practice and through the course of their lives. And we actually got some figures on traditional multilingualism. We don't have a lot because linguists unfortunately haven't seen that as part of their job. Uh, and the tools we have like EOS for Ancestors are very crude measures because they just ask for self-reports, which are always very accurate. But um, Peter Sutton, who's an amazing uh, linguistic anthropologist who worked in Western Cape York, another part of Australia that's very similar ecologically. Um, and he went through painstakingly and looked at 291 traditional marriages. So this is pre-European contact. And that's an area that has nine names dialects across five languages. So traditionally in Australia and New Guinea and a number of other areas, you just use the word that means language and it's you can't automatically decide whether it's what a Westerner might call a dialect or a language. 
well, five languages probably there. So there were 26% intra-dialect marriages and 62% cross-language marriages. So that's you know, the, the majority of marriages across the language boundary. And this is just one of his um, language teachers who uh, he could speak uh, Wurima, uh, another language called Barrow Point, Google Yimidir, uh, which is the language that gave us the word kangaroo, mm -hmm. uh, Google Yalanji, at least one variety of Lama Lama, probably two Ungula Kukuyahu uh, varieties, and Cape of Creole. Mm -hmm. and just fairly standard uh, language repertoire in a place like that. So, just to show you that this is not a uniquely Australian phenomenon, um, like when I have been working in Arnhem Land, that traditional practice in the areas I work is receding a little bit. You don't find that kids are learning across that spectrum. But once I started working in Southern New Guinea, I found that this is an area with that sort of polyglot life is still um, completely practiced. So that's just the village um, where I work to give you an idea. And this is just a map of uh, Southern New Guinea. It's a very small area. Uh, a little bit larger than the Ile de France, maybe. Um, but in that, there are about 30 languages from nine different language families, like maximal language families, and the so called Yan uh, family that I've been talking about in connection with basic numerals, mm -hmm. as shown by the heavy line there. And you can see in the sort of top corner of that uh, neck, which is the language I mostly work on. There. And across the line is Idi, which is the other language spoken by those guys with the bicycle. Uh, and in that area, most language names are what Patrick McConville has called shibboleth names. So <laughs> you, you name the language after a shibboleth. Uh, and in this area, it's most, mostly based on the word what. Yeah. So Nim, Numbo, Idi are just all, all the words for what in the language. So it's as if French was quay and English was wattish and German was wassish uh, and Italian was case. Yeah, and box so. oil is a bit like that. What? Languedoc and Languedoc. Ah, uh, yes, it's, it's a different shape. Yes. Yes. So yes, that would be like yes, yes, aqua or something, you know. But it's the same principle. It's another type. If you look at shibboleth, the names are doing typology of shibboleth, the names, you know, yes, well, no is actually commoner, in, at least in Australia and New Guinea, than yes. Uh, and then um, you what? Of course, you know, Dante was the first person to write about this. About this. Yeah. Uh, and, but here in Europe, you must, if you want what shibbolethonyms, and you go to the Balkans, there are super Croatian varieties like um, Stokowski and Chakowski and Kajkowski and so on, which are also based on, on what. So it's, it's not a unique thing, but what it shows you is that you have enough metalinguistic awareness to know that other people uh, use other words for, for what. Um, and the overall pattern then, both traditionally and today, is one of egalitarian multilingualism. So here I quote uh, Alex again, uh, which I think it's a, for a start, coining the idea of egalitarian multilingualism, that is, you can have stable multilingualism that's not diglossic in the sense of having a high language and a low language, but it's horizontal. Uh, and what's more that the maintenance of multilingualism is what also allows the maintenance of linguistic diversity, because that means you can regularly see mates from outside your small speech community without having to have some sort of lingual franker. Um, and there's a number of places um, this is found. Uh, and, and just looking at the bottom part of that quote, uh, the indulgence towards language fragmentation is only sustainable as long as the social norm is to preserve egalitarian multilingualism. And I, I think it's a very important point, especially for people interested in supporting language diversity around the world. It's not usually the case that the enemy is any particular language, like a large language like English or French or Spanish or Russian or Arabic, but rather a culture of a particular form of bi or mono or lingualism or diglossia or whatever, rather than a culture of um, traditional 
uh, egalitarian multilingualism. And if we look at what, how this is maintained, it helps to understand marriage patterns. And here in Southern New Guinea, uh, the standard marriage is based on direct sister exchange. So um, if I was to marry uh, Jan's sister, then he would marry my sister. And then we would form what you might call a, a binuclear household. We're not, not that we live together, but we've got two households, each in our own village, but we regularly hang out together, stay with, with each other, and so on. And there are special kin terms there. Mm. So uh, just if you think of person E down there, who's like, say I'm A, right? Um, so my kids, uh, and then his young here, his, his C, um, so his uh, sister D is who I married, and my sister B is who he marries. Right? Uh, so then, uh, uh, if we just look at some of them, I uh, call uh, young Tampere in this example. It, it's a type of brother-in-law, but it's mm -hmm. only a brother-in-law where you have consummated a symmetrical uh, sister exchange. If I had married um, Jan's uh, sister, but I didn't have a sister to furnish and we sort of squared something up in another way, I couldn't call him Thumbway. So it's a particular type of brother in law. And then uh, my kids uh, would refer to him as Mitarela, which is a particular type of uncle. Right? So that's a person uh, who is, if, if you look up here, your mother's brother, but also your father's sister's husband. So it has to be that particular thing. So there's a whole lot of these special uh, kinships there. And then for those special type of cousins who result from that uh, symmetric exchange, there's a special term miti, which can only be used between cousins of that type. And obviously they're unmarriageable to each other because they're too close. So when you get a system like that, uh, this just gives you a sort of start, starter pack, if you like, of two languages because you've got two parents who, who speak different languages and then you've got these two households that you move back and forth. There is no more intimate language contact than you know, sharing a bed, or, although actually husbands and wives don't share a bed there. The, you know, husband, the man shares a bed with his sons and wife shares a bed with her daughters, but you know, you do meet up in a garden place or something. Uh, uh, but still, it's very intimate. Right? And they're in a the house, and there's no sort of custom that when a wife comes to a village, she should stop speaking the language. She, can, she keeps speaking it, but she also learns the other, other local one as well. So you have these sort of um, patterns where everyone is bilingual at the level of the married spouses, but according to where they are at a given moment, the language of the surroundings is the mother tongue of one and the second one of another. Uh, although when we say mother tongue, we have to be careful because it's really father tongue that's the appropriate thing for people's official language, that is the language of my clan, which my father belonged to and which I speak like him. And here's just to make it a little bit more personal, here's uh, my most gifted language teacher, Jimmy Nibbity, there on the top right, and he has a sort of characteristic profile, so his own language is Nen, uh, which was also the language of his father, Nibbity Kawa, and of his wife's mother, Mama Bajola. And then Idi was the uh, language of his mother, Wake Magam, who's that old lady down the bottom, now deceased, and also of his father's mother, uh, and then Nambo was the language of his wife, Rusian Aniba, who's the woman second from the left there in the top. Um, and so her mother had actually come from the mother when she spoke men. So you can see that this language knowledge also gets reinforced down through the generations. So you're not necessarily coming in fresh, but you're more breathing a bit more life into a language that you've already had in your background. And then as well as those three languages, he speaks 
e really excellent English. I mean, to give you an idea, I get text messages from him from time to time, filling in little gaps and asking me, what does exogamous mean? Or what does moiety mean? Or, or things like that. You know, th those are the bits of English he doesn't quite know, but you know, everything he says. He, he really speaks um, beautiful English. Uh, and then Hirimoto, which was the local lingua franca, Austronesian based Creole, but there weren't actually any Austronesian languages anywhere nearby. It just had developed as a lingua franca. Nowadays, Tropisin is the national lingua franca, but it's not really spoken here at all, except through the church a bit. And then there are various other local languages that uh, he knows to varying degrees, and he's super keen to learn Hebrew since he's very religious and wants to do a good translation of the Old Testament, but he hasn't started that yet. Um, and just to show you that uh, he's not atypical, you don't have to look at the details here, but this is just like a bit of a survey of people's language portfolios that we did. And um, I want to say that this is not just self-reports. This is backed up by recordings. Usually if someone said they spoke three languages, we would interview them in all three of those languages just to make sure that they really spoke them. And people were very, were very honest and would say things like, well, I know this language enough to um, answer simple requests and to respond, but I can't speak it, you know, if things get more complicated, but I can understand almost everything. You know, like, stuff like that, they would say. It's, it wasn't just yes or no. Um, so, it, where I say fluent, I, I mean, you know, pretty close to fluent mastery, and uh, then some knowledge would be where they might say, well, I can understand it, but I can speak it super well. Um, so, if we look at just the fluent range, high of seven, there's one poor soul who could only speak one language fluently. Um, she was an outlier. Uh, and then the total, which people have some knowledge of, nine, a uh, couple of people had, could speak nine, both, uh, well, actually, as it happened, uh, one man, Garbo, and two women, uh, Naka and Dagama. So it, it, it's not particularly gender dependent. Uh, and then the lowest one would be two. There was one person who could just speak two or lower. That seems funny. He actually... No, that's a... Oh, it's just somehow wrong. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. No, but there should be some knowledge should be either fluent or... Yeah, so that's just a wrong figure for when you Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the point is that yeah, yeah. people are, uh, you know, pretty uh, widely multilingual. And just as we had our Waramuji myth in Western Arm Land, which sort of establishes multilingualism from the beginning of time, uh, there's a founding origin myth here of, of people coming out of uh, what's called a sucker palm. It actually looks like a huge family tree in this palm tree and in the myth the first man who was called Man, so you just have a Spanish style of thing, uh, was sort of wandering around all on his own uh, feeling lonely and he walks past this sucker palm and he hears a burble of voices coming out and he listens and thinks oh some of those are speaking idiot some of them are speaking there. So even when he's on his own, he's already multilingual. That's right, multilingual. And then he's cross-spinning one. Again. He chops down from the top of the palm and people stream out. And the first people who come out are white Australians. who's like, ah, g'day, mate. How you going? It's all reenacted. And, uh, and then people come out who speak Kiwi. And he says, oh, they're my colour, but I don't know their language at all. And then gradually, as he chops down further, they, the language becomes closer and closer to his own, and finally, he's chopped down a long way. Some other men speak as his oh, my people, I'm happy now, and so on. Uh, but the point is that, you know, right there from the start, uh, uh, multilingualism is there and it's, you know, normal. So we can, t admittedly, this is just anecdotal, and, and, you know, in the article, I mentioned this a lot more in other 
context studies that we, we talk about, but we know that there's lots of parts of the world, Mandara Mountains in Cameroon, Valpes, other parts of Amazon, a lot of Vanuatu, and many other places where this is just really typical. This would be completely non-surprising because I'm way telling you this is just normal life. Uh, and that usually coexists with high levels of linguistic diversity. And in almost all of those situations, languages have a very clear social indexing function. So it's like you are in this clan or whatever, or I am on this country which belongs to this clan. In quite a number of these languages, there's not just a single verb to mean to speak a language. You speak your own language, that is your own, meaning the language that comes to you by heritage. Your language may not be your best language. Mm. Uh, and then you mock or imitate other languages because that's what you're doing when you're you, you sort of speaking it without the rights to speak it in, in, you know, that come with ownership. So that's uh, something that's been reported in Australia, but also in New Guinea as well. Mm. Um, so there's a difference between identity and function. Uh, and people learn them to high levels of fluency. And what's important here is the scale of these societies. So typically 200 up to 1,000, or 1,000 is much larger than almost any of the groups that I've been talking about. And sometimes this goes down to 40 people. And often when you tell someone who's language with 40 speakers, but never had more than 40 speakers, they say, well, how do they survive? You know, like, how come they didn't die out? Well, you marry someone from another language. It's not a problem. And then they marry you and you just keep the language going like that. So, so it's perfectly possible to maintain a small um, thing like that. So the idea is that this is something that's a common pattern uh, in small scale societies. And given that we know that early humans, as far as we can tell, lived in small bands of people, 40 or 50, seems quite reasonable to assume they lived like this as well, intermarrying, being multilingual. Although, of course, if we're going back to the beginning of time when there wasn't full languages yet, it's, that's why I'm saying multi-protolingual or something, because you can also be multilingual in, in less complex systems. So now let's uh, talk about uh, some orthodoxies of language contact, which I think are also a bit misleading. So, uh, of course, linguists have been interested in language contact for a long time, and it's a fascinating area. Uh, but I think there's two prevailing orthodoxies that are at least not universally true, and that can prevent us seeing some important things. So one is the view that contact will always lead to convergence through cognitive streamlining. So I've quoted <coughs> Yaron Matras here, uh, in order to keep the cognitive costs in language processing low, the bilingual speaker constantly practices some interlingual identification and matching of equivalent elements based on formal and, and or functional criteria. Well, you'll see lots and lots of things like this and probably any one of us in introspection can readily identify examples where we do that in speaking <coughs> some other language. Um, uh, so he then says the lower the degree of separation between the subsets in the repertoire, the lower the cognitive costs. Um, and, you know, Weinreich talked about the speak, bilingual speaking linguistic burden, having to maintain this. Uh, lots of stuff like that mm -hmm. is around. Uh, but just beware of the obviously true statement in the domain of science. They, they can lead us astray. And I think, uh, even though I, I would completely agree with Matras and Weinreich and Julian Braumüller and so on, that these things are very, very common consequences of language contact. And that's not the same as saying that they're universal consequences of language contact. Um, and then the other widespread claim is that the regular outcome of language contact whether it be pigeonization or creolization, colonization, second language learning, is that it leads to simplification and reductions of complexity. Peter Trudgill has claimed this in his book, Sociolinguistic Typology, for example. So both of these orthodoxies are 
you know, widely believe there's hundreds of uh, case studies supporting them, and I don't wish to dispute the evidence in those case studies, but I just want to show in this uh, next couple of sections that it doesn't always work like that. There are, uh, there are other ways that things can play out. So here's a partial pedigree of um, people who have advanced alternatives to this. And actually, you know, this founding figure of modern linguistics, uh, Baudouin de Cotney, um, took about what we call correspondence simultaneity back in 1885. Um, and then when de Saussure talked about esprit de cloche, in some way he's talking about a you know, sense of differentiation. And then the same year, funnily enough, in a much less widely known paper, probably because it's written in Norwegian, <laughs> by Larsson, talks about what he called nabo opposition, forgive my bad Norwegian pronunciation, uh, but he was interested in the differentiation between Norwegian dialects, and he found some uh, fascinating uh, things where you get changes which can only be explained by people proceeding from a sort of overextending proportional relations or correspondence relations between two dialects from ones where they're genuine ones to ones where they're non-genuine ones. I'll give an example from Elijah later on of that. Uh, then on this sort of pedigree, you've got German linguist Kloss who talked about Abstand, you know, keeping distance between uh, varieties and uh, William Thurston, who did uh, linguistic anthropological field work in um, New, New Britain, he coined a term which I've misspelt I here, the, the proper spelling will appear in later slides, esoterogeny, which is one of the more difficult words to pronounce and use, uh, which he was interested in the way that people seem to be deliberately rendering their languages hard for outsiders to learn. Uh, and then Claude Agege also wrote an article about, about this. It's an interesting article, like the reinstatement of feminine gender in Nunos um, by 19th century intellectuals. And you see this often actually at the more conscious level where nationalistic or ethnicist language planners want to put stuff in which differentiates from some of And sometimes it will be an archaism, sometimes it will be something else. And this is a really interesting example from Vietnamese. So Vietnamese have been under the sort of Chinese cultural influence for many centuries, but when they definitively broke away, there had been glottalized pronunciations of voice stuff like B and so on. Um, and in the heyday of Chinese influence in Vietnam, that was regarded as a very rustic unsophisticated thing and a proper, you know, Mandarin person, um, you know, in the sense of a Mandarin official, not a Mandarin speaker, would pronounce it but as a bit. Uh, but following Vietnamese independence from China, the formerly rustic and uneducated pronunciation of voiced stops as implosives regained as a, as a sort of ethnic minority. And we're not Chinese, you know, we pronounce for stops as implosive stops. Uh, so there's a lot of these things that have been coming up. And in each case, what's interesting is you can only make sense of uh, an innovation or a phenomenon by reference to at least two languages, because you can't distance yourself from something whose details you don't know. Mm. And then more recently, there's been some other interesting work. So there's a whole volume by Bram Müller, Hüder and Kuhn, edited 2014. It's just got chapters on lots of case studies, uh, mostly European languages, so some dialect diversification, syntactic non-convergence of Judeo-Spanish in Sofia with Bulgarian, divergence of Portuguese from Spanish, uh, and, and so on. So we've gradually started to accumulate cases uh, where intimate content can produce the opposite effect to that you know, textbook convergence effect. Uh, so what do you need to get this happening? Well, you obviously need mechanisms to generate divergent structures and that they might be you know, psycholinguistic mechanisms that make it easier 
to produce formally distinct signs. Uh, I'll show you an example of this. This is what Mark Ellison and Louisa Michelli called Doppler twins. Um, but you can also get, I'll, I'll give you examples of this later on too, what we can call a summative complexification. So you put together something that sort of unifies all the distinctions needed in two or more codes, and it's very useful actually, because if you do that, you're set up to observe all the distinctions you need in any of the languages that you're, you're speaking. Uh, uh, and then you need social settings that favour the linguistic signalling of group membership distinctions. So that some of these you know, different signs get harnessed for social signalling uh, and probably some social processes of linguistic ideology or praxis which select for options. So I'll start with the lexicon, which is always the easiest place uh, to start. So Alex has written about this, so northern Vanuatu, where you've got relatively shallow time depth, strong structural parallelisms between languages, but levels of shared vocabulary below 10%. So if you were just doing lex classic lexicostatistics or something, you would conclude that the languages are far more different than they really are. Uh, and you can see that example um, there where, perfect, is it the case of every word there is non even the morphology. Yeah. So, you know, it's shocking. Like, if you were just, if you're just going off a lexicon, you say, oh, this belongs to different like families or something. Uh, but no. Uh, and there are also Australian examples like that, uh, where, uh, say, in the Western Daily River, you have language with incredibly complex verb paradigms, you know, 100 or more members in them. And if you just look at verb paradigms with all the irregularities, you would think that the languages were really, really close. Uh, and then you look at the shared lexicon that's below 10%. So, you know, there's a number of places. Well, the lexicon is just such an obvious way to signal diversification that it happens in some places. Uh, what, um, if we get any time for discussion, but otherwise at some other point, be interesting to know whether this is ever paralleled by different semantic cuts by those lexical items, because you could just sort of be pasting different words onto the exact same meanings. Um, if you look at them, people, this is an example of how people can be actually metalinguistically aware of semantic differences. So when I go to the mud of a village, my friends are always the same. Okay, you're starting to get someone with there now, you know, you should learn Idi next or whatever, and I'll tell you about Idi, you'll notice that they've got a lot more, they don't use the word prefixes, but they say they've got, there's a lot more stuff at the beginning of the word than we have. Uh, and you'll also notice that we've got a single word for eating, drinking, and smoking, but they have different words for that. So, I mean, it's also an awareness of non-coincident semantic categories, at least in some cases. I don't know. Here. So, just coming back to mechanisms. Just, just, just to answer this question yeah. quickly. For instance, in Koro, the word of wrong, which I just hear no, the third word, is also means here. Here equals no. But oh, only yeah. in Koro. So you have this polysemy in Koro uh, and not in Nemedi. Ah, oh, cool. Okay. That, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the wrong is. Wrong, 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 yeah, wrong, yeah, wrong, that's right. like really old Muslim yeah. Asian root. Um, okay, so this is an example of something being caught in flagrante delicto uh, that Ken McAllen, who was an SIL linguist, and he was present at a meeting in Papua New Guinea when a celebrated speaking community had a community meeting. It's like a small village, they decided we're going to replace our normal word for no, Bia with the word bungi, because we want to be different from other self villages. So you don't have to have an you know, Academy of Francaise or something to get this. It's not a uniquely literate phenomenon. Um, and we know, like, you just have to look at a breakup of Yugoslavia as a modern experiment where people have been frantically, you know, first of all, you sort of got Bo Bosnian going some way, and then Montenegrin, and on it goes. Um, but I wanted show that it's not just about conscious ideological choices. There's this beautiful work by um, Mark Ellison and Louisa Michelli, 
who show that there are also unconscious uh, mechanisms that can produce this. And they, they use this term doppel uh, to avoid uh, falsely implying that words were the same form of cognates, because they might be lovers. Right? So a doppel are just two words that have the same or similar forms for whatever reason. They might be true cognates or they, they might be lines or whatever. Uh, so they looked at Dutch English bilinguals uh, and they compared them to, if they exist, Dutch monolinguals, a bit hard to find. Um, English monolinguals, easy to find. Um, and they just showed them things and said, what do you call this? And the bilinguals, they would sometimes be asked in Dutch, you know, what do you call this? And sometimes be asked in English, what do you call this? And the interesting thing that they found were when there were words that have synonyms in English. Um, so in English, I can say either a picture or a photograph. Okay. Now, if I'm speaking Dutch, I have to say photograph. There's no word just like picture. Uh, and then when you ask the Dutch English bilinguals, what do you call this? You show them a photograph. They say picture when asked in English way more often than an English speaker who sometimes says picture, sometimes photograph. It's like they're suppressing the word which sounds like the Dutch word. And I witnessed several examples of this at the Grammar and Psychology Conference last week when, for example, Nicola Kant was saying, oh, what do you call a fortress in, in English? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we all have this experience. Right? We think we're not going to be able to use the word. And then the two, two sentences later, he used an English word based on a French word, which the English word didn't exist. Like, like keeping track of this is, is hard. Yeah. So you sort of suppress these things, and this is their, their study. I, I just recommend it to you as a, a really cool study to show that we get these effects coming up without needing to invoke sort of you know, deliberate ideological moves to split off from another group. And then esoterogeny, I mentioned already, so William Thurston, uh, he worked with speakers of Anem, uh, showed how they promote linguistic difference from their neighbours, uh, right down to sort of pushing languages to have high levels of suppletion, just to make sure it's hard for names to learn. Talking, again, talking to you very logically, which is, you'll probably have accused me of, of doing this on a number of occasions, but I think it's useful just to start with that, and that doesn't mean we've solved the problem. But then we have to go and look and see what's really going on and put it under the microscope. Uh, then there's this claim by Don Laycock, he published in 1982, that in a language called Buin, which is a Papuan language of southern Bougainville, in, in Papua New Guinea, there's one dialect, the Wisai dialect, where they flip the masculine and feminine forms around with respect to the other word dialect. So it's become famous in the literature. You see it cited endlessly. Unfortunately, he didn't give any examples and he published a dictionary of Buin which doesn't include any Wisai forms. So it's just this, if anyone wants project or field work site, uh, this is asking to be done because it's such a spectacular case. But I have to say it's currently a sort of unverified spectacular claim. This is one where there's really solid evidence. I, I mentioned the uh, edited book by Brandon et al. And among the very interesting chapters in that book, they've got a chapter looking at direct object marking in Iberia. So this is the thing we're saying in Spanish. You say there are one, see two, John. Uh, instead of just seeing John and that arose a, you know, a couple of a few centuries ago and it used to be there in Portuguese so it was developing in Portuguese a little bit behind Spanish but it was coming up uh, and, it is, and for a while Portugal was looking to Spain as its sort of you know the intellectual capital and then Portuguese intellectuals and nationalists broke away and wanted to assert their own Portuguese identity and this nascent direct object marking, which had been tracking not so far behind Spanish, just dived away down. So in modern Portuguese, it's not there anymore. So that's an example of just sort of nipping the trends that was happening uh, and 
stopping it from happening. It's a little bit like that um, Vietnamese case of breaking away from China and reinstating the old forms, which mm. are the implosive forms there. Mm. Now, I want to give you a really wild example from um, Australia of ezotorogeny, because this is one I've worked on myself and more happy with the details. So early on, like in the 90s, uh, a couple of papers by Australianists, so Barry Alpha, David Nash, Howard Koch, identified what they called correspondence mimicry. So these were people who were starting to look at etymologies of Australian of words in Australian languages, and their people are also really multilingual. And uh, there's a bunch of languages like, so Lobbury is fairly conservative, so typical Australian language, all the words start with a consonant. So you might get a word like nama or yama or wama or something. Whereas the Iranic languages have dropped off initial consonants. So nama, wama, yama might all become ama, but maybe with some other funny stuff happening. So then what happens when Walbury borrows a word from a randic, uh, which th then they just sort of want to Walburyize it. So they put a consonant on to make it like Walbury, but they sometimes put the wrong consonant on. So it's just like, yeah, that's their Arandic word. We've got our own Walbury word for that. We're Walburys, our words all start with consonants. Here it is, but it's not the right consonant etymologically, because you can show by the comparative method what the right consonant would be. So let's look at something a little bit like this that happens on Coburg Peninsula in Iwaja. So that was the language that Tim Mamipa was speaking in that Watamalungi story. And in that language family, which is called Iwajan, they have a five gender system reconstructable. So masculine, feminine, vegetable, neuter, and sort of miscellaneous, uh, whatever's left. And the interesting thing is that the miscellaneous gender in the language that still has that, which is only Mama, one of the few languages in that family, it's a, the rarest gender, it's got the smallest number of members, it's got, I think, about 6% or something of the lexicon belong to that one. And if you look at the running texts, it's, it's less than that. So it should be the one that's dying. But Iwaja has generalized those forms uh, to produce forms in Iwaja. So you'll see I've written the miscellaneous gender as A and a big K. The big K is a sort of morphophone that hits the consonant after it and hardens it. So if, if you put big K with an M, it becomes a B stop. Uh, and if you put big K with a Y, it becomes a J and so on. Um, so here's some examples. You, you look at the word for upper arm or shoulder. In Iwaja, that's baur. But the um, the plural form is amaur. So the way you get the roots in these languages, you look at plurals, which you, know, you just put that in front of. And you can derive um, baur historically from abaur, which is the a uh, and the big K, the harding and the maur. Uh, and in Maon, if you look at, say, his arm is Imaur, E is the masculine gender, and her arm is Inimaur, where In is the feminine, and a branch of a tree is Ma Maur, Ma is the vegetable class, and Abaur exists in Iwaja, but it means a, uh, sorry, Maon, it means a tendril of a vine, so that's the miscellaneous. So these languages really use the gender contrast to you know, get more meanings in the vocabulary. As I said, the miscellaneous class is at very low frequency, so you have to look at the frequency in the mile because it's the only one that has it. And look here, uh, I just went through a whole bunch of texts in Capella and Hitch's grammar, and uh, transitive subjects, there were zero instances of the neuter, oh sorry, miscellaneous. Um, the intransitive subjects, zero incidents, Object series, so that's pretty low, right? Zero uh, in running texts, but there are examples in their um, example sentences. So here's a possible mechanism for what happened. So the puzzle is in the wider: how do you take the rarest gender, generate a set of forms as the main forms 
in your mind and then throw away, throw it away. It's, it's weird. This is what I think happened. Uh, first of all, you would have a period, let's say this was probably in, you know, proto EY gen, something like this, where you have variation that would be what I was calling last time a language internal trade off. So, how do you assign gender to body parts? There's basically two things you can do. You can give, uh, you know, just assign them by some principle. So, say if you look at German, you know, there's die Hand and der Fuss. And doesn't matter whether the owner of the hand or the foot is a man or a woman. It's just hand is feminine, foot is masculine. But there are other languages where you inherit the gender of the whole. So a man's hand will be masculine and a woman's hand will be feminine and so on. Well, that's sort of reasonable. Usually when you look at a body part, you would know from drawing, you say a woman's hand or a man's hand. Um, there are some other things. So there's another Australian language that does both, of course, you know, like classic politicians compromise when you've got two parties who both want something, you just give them each something. Uh, but that's actually a rather bad solution. Um, but if you just go back to that conflict between two criteria, you could imagine it would generate variation. So different speakers might load one or the other criteria. So you would have got things like Amawa, uh, saying let's assign uh, arm to the miscellaneous gender, just like in German, and other people saying, oh, it's a man's hand, say, Imawa, or a woman's hand, say, Imawa, and so on. Uh, so, sorry. so there, they, they would have both been floating out there, and then at some point, what is just variation due to competing principles gets invested with social um, reading on the, you say tomato, I say tomato, Principle, right? So, you know, you guys say that, we say this, you're the ones who say Imao, we're the ones who say Abao, you're Mao speakers, we're the white speakers, we do this. So, you recategorize the causes of variation from a sort of internal linguistic cause to a social uh, cause and, and associate one form with one language and the other with another. So, at this point, they become shibboleths. And then the interesting thing you get social analogy so that once you've started entrenching this you extend it to further cases so you started off with a rather piddly small number of words where you could apply this because miscellaneous was very rare gender but this has gone so far in Iwaja that even the words for he and she so look down the bottom so Ilga is another variety mm -hmm. close to Iwaja but still got a bit more gender uh, so the word for he is ana, and the word for she is inyana, so you put in on the front. But iwaja is jana. So somehow they have created a new form for he based on the old, morphologically based on the old miscellaneous, but probably by a sort of proportional uh, application of this you say x, we say y principle. So this would be an example, I would say, of you know, divergence under contact. That is, you have an inexplicable morphological change. You can't explain what's happened here by regular processes of phonology or morphology because you've generalised a rare form and you've also put it on the forms where there was never any motivation to use it. But if you appeal to gradually extending principle of correspondence between two languages in a multilingual environment, you can account for what's gone on. So um, those are just a couple of examples. I mean, I don't have time to go through and you know, give you the hundreds that exist, but, uh, and I think we don't have hundreds actually yet, but we've got a growing number and uh, I'd be really interested uh, today or you know, subsequently to hear from other people here uh, of comparable cases, if you know of them. Uh, so, you know, group differentiation, social, social signaling through language, those are just quite standard functions of language, whether in a monolingual setting or not. Once you have multiple systems, you've got a richer set of resources to draw on for those social uh, signaling functions. And that includes relations of proportionality of sound correspondence, morphological correspondence, 
between the systems which are mutually known. Uh, and you can find examples in the lexicon, in morphophonology, morphosyntax, syntax, and so on. So you might uh, ask, well, okay, that's good, but can we ever catch it in the act? Because these are all just post hoc stories and they're suggestive, so it's a good step in a research agenda, but I'm personally never convinced until you see it happen. Or something. Uh, so I want to turn for the third time to our basic, basic uh, yam counting because we've been keeping that as a sort of unfolding story. And where the story was left on um, Tuesday was that maybe it's just a tally counting system. Does it ever get beyond that? So we had our project, um, Wellsprings of Linguistic Diversity, where we were really interested in uh, what, seeing how this scaling up from local variation between speakers to language variation occurred and doing very um, close case studies of individual speech communities. And part of the project was that wherever we were working, we would gather a bunch of interviews that should be some lively, interviews on some topic that's more as a common top, topic across a bunch of speakers. Now, we localise that to the area, uh, but in the southern New Guinea part of the project, we were gathering what I called coconut stories, because coconuts are a real big thing. People love talking about coconuts. They talk about the future, they talk about the past. They're related to people. There's life stories. They hang off the coconut stories and so on. So we had a bunch of these coconut stories, um, which were just there to pick up all sorts of variation. And as it happened, and I'm sorry, I should just say, before getting the person to talk about the coconut tree, that the format was always you had someone standing under their favourite coconut tree, or sometimes you'd do three of these under different coconut trees, and then you'd have one or two interviewers who were local people asking questions in language. And instead of just getting metadata, we had about 10 lead up interviews, uh, interview questions like what's your name, what's your clan, how old are you, you know, how many years of school did you do and, and so on, just to make the metadata data, actually, if you like. Um, so then here are some examples of this and I'm going to show you three steps, two of them I'll show the videos, one I'll just record because of reasons of time. And the first one, this is a guy called Joshua Wenigalmino. So he's the sort of village cosmopolitan. He spent a lot of time out in Port Moresby, the national capital. Um, he's a fluent speaker of English, likes to, likes to speak English to show he's a sort of modern guy, um, speaks to Pisin, um, and that's several other languages, and also speaks men. Right? And he's also a social outsider in lots of ways that I'm not quite sure why, but the community, you know, is sometimes a bit nasty to him and his family, maybe because his wife is from a long way away, from Port Mosby. And when he is asked some of these questions, he um, is speaking fluent then, but in the middle of it, he uses the, when he's asked what his age is, he uses the English numeral. Oh, so let's go back. Ah, I thought this was alive. Hmm. Okay, well I'll just I'll just read this one out to you then. Mm -hmm. The sound not working. So um, someone says to him, Oh, how old are you? And he says, You the gay woman are 36, 36 year the name So you can hear that. He starts off in Nen, that's in red. Then he says February 10, 1972. So all of the dates and numbers are in English, and then the rest is in Ming. Uh, and he's, well, he says he's 36, he's roughly that age. Right? Now, so he's about 36. This next interview is with his father, and he's a traditionalist uh, who knows very little English. That's a little bit. Uh, and his name's Minon. He's uh, being interviewed. And during that interview, he talks about a whole lot of other stuff. And 
He's just talking then because it's his main language, but every now and then he throws in an English expression when a number is involved. So he was talking about traditions of young men being initiated, and they say, Armangwen Gedinjaran Kitrawara, 20 years. So they would go into the men's house at the age of 20 years. Now he's being interviewed by Jimmy Nibbity, who you saw earlier, who's, a, who's younger, he's about 45, and he's a bit of a men purist. ethnic purist, yeah. Uh, and one of his things is to just always coin men words and push other people to use them. So he prompts um, Minon, uh, so it says Minon, uh, like what's it, then it, then it like this, Namis Pusombes Kup. He rewords 20 into men, sort of on the fly, so it's clear he's doing it fluently. So he says, three sixes, two units. That is 20. And then Minon, sort of under the force of Jimmy's personality, but also like some of his court, you know, who's that being a bit wrong, he, he, he sort of gets his game together and he says, Namis Pusombes Kup. He repeats what he had said before. So that's interesting. In terms of age, we've got the younger man pushing the basic system over the older man who's using the English-based 10 system. And now, as our third example, uh, we've got Goy Dibod, who's, in, as far as I can tell, the same age as Joshua, but very differently situated in the community. So he's the village chairman, he's very much someone who is by gardening, he's got his own crocodile farm, you know, the village, he's someone who is passionate about village traditions and so on. Uh, his English is just as good as, as Joshua's, I would say, uh, but he keeps the languages very apart. Um, and here's him being interviewed by his sister-in-law, actually, and she's going to say, she says, how many years old are you? I'm not including that part, but his reply is, okay, so he's, she said, how old are you? She, she, she actually asked him in any language because that's the language she speaks. And he replies and says, Oh, meta maybe, and the one thirty-six. So he's replying in then. Uh, and then a bit further on in the interview, she says, How old were you when you went at school in Dimsisi? Again, she asks him in Idi, and he replies, Okay, so his answer was, um, my school, or at, at my school, there in Dimsisi, the village where we went to school, from there, uh, when I went there uh, to my father's uh, place of school, we, we I went in, uh, and then he says, one, six, year, two, and two years uh, in Dara. Right? So I, I went there at the age of six and then spent four years uh, in Dara. So he's using these men, what I was saying yesterday, maybe they were tally words, but he's really using them as numerals uh, to quantify uh, years and other things. Now let's just give a chance for our Zoom listeners to listen to that. So uh, the point here is that there's two people of similar ages uh, one is very consciously using those tally terms as numerals, and that is an extension that is differentiating men from English. So, so I would say this is you know, content-induced uh, diversification inside the numeral system, and we are watching this happen as we compare different individuals in the community. And it's, it is an innovation because the people who are using it, like Jimmy, and Goy are both younger 
than people of Minong's generation who use them as tally words, but not as numerals. But it's not the case that everyone in that 30s to 40s generation uses them. It is the people who identify very strongly with their men identity. So it's the sort of thing that tallies with the, um, you know, what we're thinking of as heterogeneity, but the irony is that it's distancing from English and not from another local language. But after all, people here will just, they just see English as one more dialect. They don't, they don't see English as sort of some giant uh, language like it's seen in some other parts of the world. So now I want to talk about another consequence of language context, which I'll call um, complexification uh, and of multilingualism. So first case study is um, now classes of genders in two pretty closely related languages, Bidigumo and Dalgo. So this is about like probably Spanish and Italian in, in terms of how closely related they are, certainly more closely related than French to either of those. Um, and there, there's a little map shown there they are. And the languages are similar, but their noun classes are rather different, or the noun morphology is rather different. So in Gunwingu, it's a bit like what we saw for Mao. You've got typical Australian four noun class systems, so na for masculine, na for feminine, man for vegetable, gun for neuter, so na got by, old man, na got by, old woman, mandajek is a Revelia, particular plant species, Munmin is a seed, Gunwa is language, and Gunmin is an I. So you'll notice the shared root Min, which can mean I or C, a couple of other small round objects. And then some nouns just don't have a prefix, like Dawa, woman, for example. Dawabon has a different system. So there, if you think of the bottom ones first, what we can call absolute nouns. These are ones which can just occur, they don't need to be possessed. So, Rolo, dog, I can possess dog if I want. So, if I say Rolo, not his dog, Rolo, na, my dog, and so on. Uh, but then with part nouns, both body parts and a few other things like your spirit and your soul and your voice and your shadow, um, they have to be possessed. So, for example, nose, there's, the root is J, but you could never just say J on its own. You would have to say J not his or her nose, or J not uh, my nose. If you translate Goggle's story, the nose, into, I guess it's Luné in French, yeah, yeah into Dalaban, it would have to be J not his, his nose. Uh, so, that's the basic distinction in Dalaban between possessed nouns or part, part nouns if you like, and absolute nouns. Now loads of people are and have traditionally been bilingual between these two varieties and one of the dialects of Pinkunwak, this on the Kuningu side, Kuningu, had a particularly intense bilingual identity. And if you look at, so I've done checks on a number of these different varieties and it's never quite the same. But in this dialect, what happens is you keep the uh, typical Gunwingu system with the four overt classes and then an unprefixed one, but you subdivide inside the vegetable and neuter classes into ones which are uh, vegetable absolute, like the Revelia, Mandaji, and vegetable possessed. So, manmin, uh, I'm told it could mean C, but you could also call that minna, just like in Dalabon. And uh, gunwok is an absolute, uh, but then gunmin, I, you can also call that minna. So, you know, if you just see minna on its own, it's ambiguous in Gunwingu as it is in Dalabon, but it has a different alternate according to what its meaning is. So I would argue that here you've got a complexified system where you've put together the two principles, the part principle used by Dalabon and the four basic noun class system 
used by Domingo and you've combined them. And this type of complexification is most spectacular when you look at mixed languages. So everyone knows about pigeons and that they result from the sort of lowest common denominator, this is the general view at least. Uh, you get rid of anything too complex or not found in both languages and you retain the things that are. But that's not the only possible outcome of intense language contact. And uh, we're starting to see more examples of what they call mixed languages as a result of what um, Pete Backer calls language intertwining. So there you just have communities that know both languages with native levels of fluency, uh, traditionally, you know, completely fluently bilingual in both, and then something happens where you get the emergence of a new identity predicated on that bilingual identity and all the stuff gets loaded up into a new form. So uh, this really interesting language, uh, Mishif, uh, which is now an endangered language, it's just some elderly people who speak it, but it, it resulted from marriages between Canadian French uh, male trappers, like fur trappers, and priests, their priest-speaking wives. So in those households, and especially the children, they would have spoken Canadian French and uh, Cree, and Michif itself is, a, I guess, an assimilation of the French word Métis, which would be Métis, I think, in uh, Canadian French, so that the palabra is in front of the E. Mm. Uh, so then, uh, how does Michif work? Well, you basically put together all the phonemes of French and all the phonemes of Cree, and you get a nice complex uh, system. I didn't, I didn't show you that. Something I personally find fascinating is that even when you get what looks like the same phoneme, like two Ps, uh, they're not pronounced identically in the two languages, and they end up as different phonemes as well. Uh, uh, but here's a, a more sort of simple to uh, understand example. So French, as everyone knows, you know, has two genders, masculine and feminine, and you show them by the articles, among others. Uh, and then Cree also has two genders, but it's based on an animate, inanimate distinction, and shows up in demonstratives. So now, if you just want to say, you know, this girl, or yon fields, or something in, in Michif, you would say something like, awa la fille, right? Where you put the Cree type distant uh, animate demonstrative and then the French type article and then the noun and then if you say yon fields you put nema it's an inanimate yon inanimate and, and then the the le uh, I think it comes out as le in uh, chief uh, and then and chon for, for fields right so you're just running along to gender systems at once pulling them together so at uh, this lovely uh, book by Pete Backer described it, and there was some other work uh, before as well, but it was a bit late in the game. There, there weren't sort of new uh, speakers coming into the world, nor was it being formed. So people thought, oh, well, shame about that. You know, we can't watch this happening. And then in the very early 2000s, two PhD students at the time in, in Australia uh, Felicity Meekins and Carmel O'Shaughnessy were both doing their PhDs on what you could call chaotic bilingual language acquisition. So just where there's a couple of languages floating around, but it's not like the father speaks this and the mother speaks this, uh, as in standard pictures. So that's what they had set out to do, understand language acquisition in a chaotic bilingual setting. And miracle of miracles, each one found a mixed language being born just as they went up there to do their PhDs. And I'm going to talk about Gurindji Creole, uh, but Kamala Shams is also in about a novel called White Wobbly, and they're very, very similar stories. Um, so, this is basically what happened. You've got the very rapid evolution of a mixed language. So, you have grandparents fluent in two source languages, at least, I should say, because they're often no other language like Wobbly. Uh, so Gurindji, which is traditional Australian Tamanuan language, and, and Creole, which is an English, English lexifier. Creole, rather complex actually, it's not 
you certainly wouldn't want to call it a pigeon. It's got a lot of morphology and a lot of traditional um, Australian type categories in kinship and number and inclusivity. Um, but it's been around there for some generations. And then the children of that grandparental generation uh, don't speak either source language fluently, but they use elements of both. Um, uh, and then the grandchildren speak this mixed language, which gets called their um, Buddhist Creole. So they've just fused it together. That's the way they speak. Uh, I should add that you know English is increasingly part of the mix as well, but that's not part of this story. Uh, and then more recently, so so each um, you know Carmel Shanti and Felicity Megan's each wrote quite a lot about this uh, respective mixed languages that they were working on. And then more recently, uh, each working with a range of other people has been gathering a whole lot more uh, data on this. And uh, to take an example of, of Kurinji Creole, Felicity Meekins has been working both with community members like uh, Cassandra, uh, Ron, sorry, um, Cassandra Algy, who, who's a Gurindji speaker, and then Lyndall Bromham, who's an evolutionary biologist, and and Shakwadu, who's a uh, basically mathematical model of evolution. And they've been adapting models from population genetics, where you look at gene frequencies in different populations, which is what you can think of the top there. So you've got our different generations, right? Uh, and then a whole lot of different linguistic features of the sort that linguists say interested in and then you track those down through the generations and see how the frequencies at each level uh, knock on to the generation. One of the things that they were interested in testing was whether there was a bias towards adopting simpler variants. So some of the alternatives they coded up, is this a more complex or a simpler one? And what they found is that no, actually, um, sometimes complex variants got through just as well. But that, uh, there's obviously some, lots more to be done. There's probably a lot more mixed languages out there and some being born as we speak. Uh, and I, I think this is a really important area to work on because languages you can sort of describe any time, but acts of birth, as you know, uh, you know they, they only last us a certain amount of time and it's really important to be sort of there when it happens. Um, now I want to talk about another example of complexification, uh, which is another Australian example. Uh, maybe I'm familiar to some of you and I'm going to present it a little schematically in, in the hope that it will arouse your interest enough that you'll read really more about it. So you might know that across most of Australia, in addition to kinship regulations, which are just based on my father or my mother's brother or whatever, you have what are sometimes called sociocentric categories, which encompass everybody and which form a sort of social order template, putting people in categories and reaching far beyond in one language. They reach out over whole regions and they, they can extend over thousands of kilometers actually. It means that as you move from group to group, there's at least some way you can be placed and fitted in as an outsider. And I'll start by a fairly schematic level because this is dealing with sort of more postulated early phases. If we think of how to divide into two, um, and if we think of things which are transmittable down, you can either do that on the basis of matrimoities, so I'm in the same matrimony as my mother. So let's say I'm here, I'm in matrimony alpha, there's my mother up there, um, and of course I should marry someone from, me. well, my mother married a beta man, um, and my father is a beta, I'm an alpha, because he had to marry the opposite of matrimony. Mm -hmm. okay, so the way you test for it is whether you get the same as your mother. There's an alternative principle of so-called patrimonies, where you're in the same one as your father. So now, if I'm this guy here, the, uh, then uh, my 
you see. Mm-hmm. No, no, here I am, A, right? And I got it from my father, who was A. And my mother was B, so I'm not in the same uh, patrimony as her. So mm-hmm. those are two alternative principles. Uh, you can use one or the other. Mm-hmm. Or why not have both? And there are a number of Australian societies that use both for different purposes. Maybe some rituals are transmitted in a matrilineal way, some in a patrilineal way, or actual clan membership is transmitted by patrimonies, and maybe some ritual things or spiritual things are translated, but transmitted by matri things. So you can then put them together, and of course, when you multiply two by two, you get four. So what I've done here is just shown what happens when you put the two together. So you've got A's and alphas, B's and beta's, A's and beta's, and B's and alphas, and that gives you four categories. Because if, let's say, I just start down here at the bottom, right, I'm in the same patrimony as my father, but the opposite patrimony to my mother, uh, and I'm in the same matrimony as my mother, who's a, you know, some B beta, so beta is the, the matrimony, uh, but I'm in the opposite patrimony to her, and so on. So you, you get this full class system. And four class systems, which are sometimes called section systems, are found in many parts of Australia, but they're also found in a couple of parts of Vanuatu, I think it's on Malikula, and found in some parts of the Peruvian Amazon. And they seem to be the three areas where they've evolved seemingly independently. But then in Australia, we also get something which has never been reported anywhere else, an eight-class system, which Aboriginal people call skins often, Mm. um, and which anthropologists call subsections. Mm. And Patrick McConville wrote an absolutely beautiful paper in 1985, a long time ago now, but it's such a classic, I recommend it to all of you to read the origin of subsections in Northern Australia, because it had always been a mystery. Where did this come from? And having arisen, it then is diffused over a wide area so you can travel, you know, 20 tribes away, 20 languages away, and work out, oh yeah, this person's my uncle, this person's my wife, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what his model proposed in really a beautiful piece of detective work, because he showed that the eight terms basically could be broken down into two sets of four, and for each set of four, there was a sort of residual language off to one side or the other of the subsection zone, which had cognates of those. So that the set of eight arose by putting together two sets of four, and then there were even myths which, although it was slightly cryptic, or if you interpret them in a certain way, uh, suggested that you had two adjoining societies, bilingual, with parallel systems, but uh, marriage was circulating spouses across the two languages, and you gradually put them together to get this eighth subsection system. So I don't have the time now to go into the details, but it's a, a beautiful example of complexification. And these subsections are, you know, an important part of the language system. Mm. They're important anthropologically, but they also have linguistic features and they're part of the cognitive training of young children. So where I work on Billy Woodlock, for example, there's a children's game where three-year-olds uh, give each other the name of a particular subsection. So they might say Nagara, and then everyone's racing to say the name of the mother's mother's subsection of that subsection. <laughs> so you train to do this earlier. So uh, started to draw things together now uh, and going right back to the original point about multilingualism and language evolution and tying it to what I said in the first lecture about gradualism, if we see language evolution as a process involving the assemblage of many different things, using word order to code um, grammatical relations, or using, you know, forming adjectives, or having a distinct adjective class, 
or you know, having a past tense marker. I mean, any one of the hundreds and hundreds of features that make a language what it is, uh, each one of those, the, uh, being a innovative step, which was taken by some group at some point through processes of language change, gradually assembled together. Or another one, having pronouns like I and you, uh, that's a completely um, independent thing to working out how to do negation, which is you know, a non-trivial thing to evolve negation, for example. Uh, so the idea is that our really, really early ancestors, however long ago that might be, however long ago we think proto-humans or proto-hominins were starting to speak and evolve language systems, maybe 300,000 or 600 or 800,000, depending what you believe, it doesn't matter here. Uh, there were small groups of people getting together, exchanging spouses and learning each other's languages because they were mutually uh, dependent. And through that process, pooling the breakthroughs that each group was making on its own because these were independent things. So this is how what we can think of as the modern language package, just as we can think of the modern farming package or the modern internet package, each building together lots of innovations, you know, made in different places and times. Uh, that's how I think it's, it's a useful way to regard uh, language evolution, because it, it's much more plausible, it doesn't require miracles in, in, in terms of a sterilian planet uh, use, and it's compatible with what we know about demography, marriage patterns, and linguistic repertoires of other small-scale societies. So then that gets us out of that old, sterile, fruitless monogenesis versus polygenesis debate, and we can have this thing polyhemogenesis, so polyhemogenesis, where you've got lots of different places where you get partial genesis, you know, some things get uh, developed. And I think it's a much more plausible, incremental, gradual scenario for how human language evolved. We're just turning to the last uh, slide and just thinking, okay, we've had a brief moment together in the four classes. Uh, where does that leave us? as linguists interest, interested in linguistic diversity and for me I would say as soon as you're interested in linguistic diversity you should be interested in the evolution of linguistic diversity because as soon as you have a what question, that is what is there, you get a how question, a how does it function and a, and a how does it get there question. Uh, so a first job just as typologists if you like or comparative linguists is to chart the full extent of linguistic diversity phenomena and there's still lots of things that we didn't even know existed as phenomena uh, which will be way outside what Wiles or Waterbank or whatever think to ask about because Wiles and Waterbank are interested uh, in the sort of short fat body of the dinosaur and there's a whole lot that's out there in the long tail but that's if you grow up learning that language you just think well that's what language is like. Um, so I really like this quote from the anthropologist Don Tusin that if world culture is the anthropological laboratory, substitute linguistic laboratory if you like, comparison its experimental method, then the crucial instances are surely those which are empirically the least probable. For just as in physical science, these tend to have the greatest information content. So that's on value of rara, if you like. And then for each one of these, as I've said, we need to develop a clear account of how it arose. Um, but then we need to turn our attention to studying typological changes in progress because some of these things that's just very natural, for example, the erosion of words through frequencies, if slow, you know, we know that back to front. But some of the things that are weird and strange uh, just taking sedary numerals or subsections or whatever that you don't find many places, you've got to explain how that arose. And it could be that like peacock's tails or antlers on reindeers or things, that, that they seem perverse, like it seems like a lot of work to uh, develop them. 
We know from theories of sexual selection why we get peacocks, tails and antlers, that is they are signalers of highly efficient, successful individuals. I think social signalling, that is, you're a really member of my group, you've been there from the beginning, that's why you've managed to learn this incredibly hard phonological system, or this incredibly irregular morphological paradigm, or this incredibly rare grammatical phenomenon. It's a plausible line of argument, but in each case, we should be able to demonstrate how it's happening, rather than just have just just so story. And we haven't got very far with that as linguists, because the realm, the tools of variationist research and of typology and of historical linguistics haven't really come together very much. Uh, then the fourth thing, right, relating to what I talked about yesterday, is to get a better understanding of selectors. Linguists have had a lot to say about internal selection you know, since the beginning of that discipline, but external selection of various kind has been a bit of an orphan, and we've started to see lots of interesting things coming up here. It's both a matter now of having useful databases. I think here things like, you know, Wiles and Foible and so on are really good because they do allow these comparisons. Um, and partly it's about having good conceptually, conceptual modelling, because being able to computational, computationally model these things has really changed how we think about the role of weak selector biases. Uh, and then the, the last one, what I've been talking about today, to expand our understanding of how multilingualism can drive both complexification and diversification. Because I think there, there could well be some processes which can only occur in multilingual settings. And it has been a tendency in linguistics to take the monolingual speech community as a unit of analysis, or if we do, if we do look at multilingual communities to look at it in sort of socio-linguistic terms, but there's also a lot happening at the level of structure there. So uh, I, I think I'll leave things there just in order to have a few minutes uh, for questions, and I'd like to thank you all for you know, your intense attention uh, during these uh, four classes. And there's a whole bunch of other people I'd like to thank as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for this beautiful cycle. So we have four minutes for questions, either in the chat or in the room, or both. And uh, so go ahead, please, in the chat for Zoom members. And if you have questions in the class, in the classroom, go ahead. <laughs> Alex. Uh, thanks, Nick. Beautiful uh, lecture, as always. Um, of course, I was fascinated with, uh, the, especially the topic today about diversification, divergence, and stuff. And then uh, one question, which is sort of a lingering question when you talk about around esoterogeny, right? Uh, around mm. Topics of esoterogeny and uh, divergence in contact is the question of how how much awareness or how much conscious how conscious these movements are. Right? And I remember having a conversation in this case with, with Malcolm Ross, and um, uh, we were talking about you know, how languages can become very different, uh, and and at some point I said, oh, of course this is subconscious this is and and Malcolm corrected me think, thinking I, I had slipped you know <laughs> uh, my, my tongue had slipped and I said you mean of course it is conscious and I said no of course it's non conscious <laughs> so there's this uh, and then some uh, cases you cited like the Laycock example I mean it seems to be overly conscious I mean so seems to be examples of you know people gathering and say okay let's change our masculine and feminine genders and it's kind of it feels weird I do have the, I, I do think it's somewhere in the oh, in the case of that, um, but that's uh, a Laycock example, he didn't report anything about how it had happened, yeah. he just reported the result. And uh, unfortunately, it's still a slightly dodgy result because it's mm. not well thing. But he did, he did, it was, a, was on the same slide, whereas that community meeting to change the word for no and so on. Uh, I think if I'd been Malcolm, 
I, I would have also disagreed with you, but I would have disagreed with the of course part, because I, I think it, my view is that it's working across whole spectrum yeah. from conscious to unconscious. I was going to say it's a great in the yeah. zone between. I, I think so, you know, but all through and, and when I was talking, I think it was in the second class about languages of phenomena of the third kind, that is the unconscious uh, outcome of intentional actions or unplanned outcome of intentional actions. I think that's a useful way to see it because I, I might be very intentionally thinking, I don't want to sound like that Alex guy, you know, and I'll move away from him uh, linguistically, but I might not be thinking, oh, and I'll create a blue perfect in the process of life, and I'll switch all my genetics. So, so you just sort of have a goal which you're trying to achieve by some means, but the exact way you achieve it in the here and now and then later on the way that gets out into the system because of course people are sampling what individuals do across hundreds of millions of utterances that then introduces a lot of other factors so, so i think it's likely to be occurring at multiple levels at once but it's something we totally need to look at and also we need to um, ask well does it work differentially in different parts of the language system could be that what's happening in phonology and lexicon, which are the, probably the most spectacularly accessible areas. I think actually semantics is the least accessible area. I think that's where people are least aware of boundary differences across languages. Uh, in syntax, there are some things that people are really aware of, like word order and so on, and other things they're probably not so aware of. Mm -hmm. But the, the explanation you gave about the invisible hand and the invisible third. Third type, you would say? The phenomenon of the third yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. It looks like it's sort of a good solution. Mm. Yeah, and um, and uh, can I just add as a last word that, of course, in four classes, there's only so much you can say. Mm. And uh, I'm sure lots of people have you know, unanswered questions or things they'd like to pursue. So I see the role of this is just putting some interesting questions on the table. And I, I hope that with various people that will start conversations we'll pursue over the months and years to come. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you to Piazza and to you, uh, Mina, and to Isabel in Absentia uh, for the kind invitation to come here. It's been a lovely opportunity.